Ha-ha, we're on. All right, you can stop talking amongst yourselves and listen to me for the next two and a half hours. Some of you got nervous, didn't you? Welcome to Aviator Church. Those of you who decided to come Labor Day weekend, I got to tell you something right off the top. You are God's favorite people. Did you know that? Um, I talked to a family who uh, is regular attenders here, and that's fine. That's fine. They're regular attenders. Uh, and then I talked to them. I said, hey, I'll see you at church on Sunday. And uh, the wife and mother said to me, actually, no, we're going to be at the lake. And I said, oh, okay. I guess that's what we're doing these days. We're just going to the lake. We're just, you know. Who needs church, right? And she told me to be quiet, which she should have done, because sometimes you need to go to the lake. Can I get an amen? So anyways, I'm glad you guys are here. For those uh, who are at the lake uh, currently, then we will make sure that they know uh, that they can find all of our messages online at youtube.com slash aviatorchurch. Uh, and this is going to be a good one for what it's worth. I'm super excited about this message. Now, I've got to be totally upfront with you. Like, I usually can tell about how long I'm going to preach based on the number of slides that I have. And like a full sermon is about 18 slides. If I have 18 slides, I'm going like a solid 42 minutes. And that's like my talk for 42 minutes, which means like 54 minutes, right? Uh, today, we have 31 slides. So uh, the reason for that largely is because last week I mentioned that, you know, like we we're us checking the times of the games for the NFL season, whatever. I didn't even realize that apparently these millionaires who get paid a lot of money to play a game for a living needed an off week between the preseason and the regular season. So there's no games this week. So I figure we'll get it all in. We're actually going to be continuing our series on Deuteronomy called Choose Life. And we're going to be doing it again today. We're going to do an entire chapter. The entire chapter 9 of Deuteronomy is what's going to be our scripture for today. And what I'm going to start off by is saying this. This will be a message that you might understand a little bit better if you've been at Aviator for a while. And the reason is because this is going to tie into a series that we did previously. How many of you were here when we did Types and Shadows? Anybody? You guys remember that? So in case you're uh, not familiar, this is uh, Deuteronomy 9. Do you guys remember Types and Shadows? Types and Shadows, uh, essentially, when we're talking about Bible study, goes like this. That the Old Testament, this is a fun one. The Old Testament is, uh, the reason we call it the Old Testament is because it is? Very good. And so the Old Testament uh, is all the stuff that happened before Jesus, right? So Jesus shows up in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then everything after that essentially discusses or lays out the theology of what Jesus did. The Old Testament exists prior to Jesus because it's old. And so what we did during Type and Shadow was we looked at a bunch of the Old Testament characters and, and learned to study the Bible with a Christ-centric mindset, right? Meaning that when you're looking at the characters in the Old Testament— the purpose that they serve was to point people towards the true and the better. So those characters exist in large part as a type and a shadow of Jesus Christ, who is the true and the better. And so the example that we use throughout that series, and I've, I've mentioned a million times, but for those of you who might be new, it, it looks a little bit something like this. In the story of David and Goliath, uh, the, the, the typical sermon sounds something like this. David got out there, and with bold faith, he slew Goliath. He conquered his giant. He knocked down the mighty warrior. And so, church, now you need to figure out, because you are David, what is your Goliath? What is standing in front of you that you need to have faith in? And that's like an okay sermon, I suppose, if the purpose of what we're doing here is for me to give you pep talks about how to be better at your job, right? That's not my goal here. My goal here is that you leave here understanding what God's word is actually says. And so when we look at the story of David and Goliath, we're not looking that we are David and we're going to be the hero of the story. David is a type and a shadow. He looks something like Jesus. He, his shadow is a shape similar to what Jesus did, but he was not the true and the better. So the story of David and Goliath really goes something like this. There was an army, it's called the Israelite army, and every day this defiant giant who, ha, 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 that rhymed. Anyways, uh, this big giant would get out and he would call taunts to the people and he would call uh, their mothers all kinds of names and he would call their God into question and he would say, who's going to come and fight me, right? And the entire Israelite army, they stood on opposite hills and while Goliath taunted the Israelites, the Israelites stood there with their legs shaking and a little dribble running down their legs and they were terrified, right? And so a 
essentially the story of David and Goliath is not that you are David getting ready to slay your giants and you go get them and yay team. The story of David and Goliath is that you are the Israelite army and you're staring down an enemy that you could not possibly defeat on your own and you are in desperate need of God to send a deliverer, of God to send a savior who can fight the battle that you could never win. Spoiler alert, Goliath is sin, right? Sin is something that we are all afflicted with. Sin is something that will take all of us down. It is something uh, that, that will be the end of us. And we are in desperate need of a Savior. And so David is the type and shadow of the Savior character who Jesus was. This was a, a way in which the people could begin to train their eyes to see who Jesus was going to be. And so today, we're going to look at Moses, and, and we've been talking about Deuteronomy. And if you haven't been here, Deuteronomy, uh, the meaning of Deuteronomy is the second law. So this is Moses, the, the Israelites, they escaped from Egypt. You've probably seen that on a cartoon or something, right? Uh, the Red Sea parts, and they cross, and then it crashes back down on the Egyptians, and then they go to Mount Horeb or Mount Sinai, uh, and they spend a little bit of time there. God gives them rules and laws. We're going to talk about that some today. And then finally, after a promise that was made to Abraham some 800 years before, they finally go to the promised land. They send spies into the promised land. The spies get in there, and they look at the people, and do you guys... How many of you love the voice that I do when I talk about the spies and how big the people were? They got there and they said, you people are too big, right? The people are too big. We're too scared. We can't go take the promised land because apparently they forgot that their God was bigger than the people who were there. And we're going to talk about them a little bit more again today. And so anyways, where we find ourselves now is after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness as a consequence for their refusal to enter the promised land, for their refusal to trust God, now Moses, at about 120 years old, is talking to a bunch of young whippersnappers and trying to give them wisdom. And again, I've spent my entire week doing that with my children to mixed results, right? And so we've watched Moses do this, and he keeps saying the same thing. We talked about this last week. There's themes that you hear over and over and over. You guys remember a million years ago now, we talked about something called the Deuteronomic Principle, and the Deuteronomic Principle is what Moses basically says a million times throughout the book of Deuteronomy, which is obey and live, disobey and there you go, right? And so here we are, Moses, they're just about to get ready to enter the promised land. Moses is having this conversation, but today I want to go back to type and shadow because we haven't done this yet, but Moses fits this role in a lot of ways. But the chapter 9, the more I read it this week, I got like actually emotional about it because it is such a clear picture of who Jesus is. Moses serves such an absolutely beautiful, clear picture of who Jesus would be coming behind him in a very specific capacity. And so I want to look at that. So before we do that, would you guys join me in prayer so that I don't mess this thing up? <laughs> Father God, we come to you today, and God, we ask that your word would shine through today. God, we ask that uh, you would use this incredibly broken vessel to convey your perfect word. That God, ultimately, as we look at the exhausting life and work of Moses having to deal with all of these people and trying to get them to listen and trying to get them to obey, that God, as we look at the exhausted work of Moses, we would see the glorious work of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would uh, open someone's eyes to this brand new truth today. God, we love you, we praise you for your word, and we ask that you open our hearts and, and, and open our minds that we might be ready to hear what you have for us. In your name we pray, and everyone said... All right, now listen, I don't even have, look at this, I got no notes up here, right? Uh, and the reason for that is we're just going straight through the chapter. I'm going to talk when I feel like I want to talk. You guys will listen intently throughout the duration, but we are going to answer three questions today. If we're going to understand chapter 9 as a type and shadow, we need to answer these three questions. Number one, in this particular chapter, what is the role of God? Number two is, what is the role of the people? And then I made a little line there, right? Uh, because those two we're going to cover first in the first half of the chapter. And then we're going to look at Moses' role uh, and what role he plays. And then we're going to look at how that compares to who Jesus is in our relationship, right? So anyways, that's kind of the thing we're going to be going through. We're going to answer these questions. And by the end of it, we're all going to have learned something and been better for being here. Yeah? Here we go. Let's go. Starting in verse 1. Hear, O Israel. How many times does it say, hear, O Israel? Listen, you non-listeners. 
You are about to cross over the Jordan today to go in to dispossess nations who are greater and mightier than you. Cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the sons of Anakim, whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Now, quick pause. We have been covering this for a long time. If, if you get lost on any of the story today, here's what I would recommend. Go back and listen to the previous 17 messages on YouTube, okay? We We've been doing this for a minute, right? But what you need to understand is they're getting ready to enter into the promised land. And there's this cool thing where Moses says this. Uh, the, the Lord's here. Uh, a people great and tall, the, the sons of the Anakim, whom you know and whom you've heard it said, who can stand before these people? We're getting ready to dispossess people who are bigger and mightier than you are, right? And you've heard it said of them, who could possibly do that? Do you know where they heard that? Their parents, exactly right, 40 years ago. 40 years ago, when the Israelites stood on the, on the brink of entering the promised land, the people went in, and you know what it was. They said, your people are too big, right? They looked at the people, and they said, they're enormous. We couldn't possibly fight them. And here's the thing. You may look at it and say, well, that's, that's like really like small-minded, like you know, God is big and all this and that. But I will say this. Once upon a time in Hutchinson, I was in a men's basketball league, uh, and I was in the old fat guy league, which was the church league, but there was a competitive men's league. And that competitive men's league got shut down uh, because of too, too many fights or whatever. So anyways, one of the teams who was in that competitive men's league that had a bunch of dudes who played for Hutch Community College, which is a pretty big deal, uh, and then a bunch of other young guys who played at various colleges, they decided, let's form a church, right? And so they showed up, and our first game of the season was against these guys, and every one of them was like 6'7", no joke, opening tip goes back, guy gets the ball, takes one dribble, throws a lob pass, homeboy runs, jumps from about the free throw line, catches it, and throws it down. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> and I thought to myself, there's no way we could beat them. Nothing short of a miracle would allow us to beat them. And that was correct. We got killed, right? And so the people are looking at these people, and they're huge, and they're enormous. And when you're squaring off in a battle, size is a thing that's kind of important. And so they're looking, and they might say, oh, we're too scared. And so Moses is taking them back. Remember, your parents said the same dumb thing. You be quiet now, right? Who can stand before the sons of Anak? Verse 3, know therefore today that he who goes over before you, he being God, who goes over before you as a consuming fire, is the Lord your God. He will destroy them and subdue them before you, so you shall drive them out and make them perish quickly, as the Lord has what? Promised you. As the Lord has promised you. Can anybody remind me what type of land are we dealing with here? It's the promised land. This thing will be the fulfillment of a promise from God, which means when you go in there, you go in there with the confidence and the understanding that this is a thing that God has spoken into existence. And I don't know if you're familiar with the creation account, but when God speaks things into existence, they just happen to be. And so here, what he's saying is like, you're going in, they're big and tall, yeah, 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 your parents were dumb. Listen, it's not about you, it's about the God who goes in before you. He will deliver the people over to you. They will perish quickly as the Lord has promised you. Verse 4. Do not say in your heart after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you. Quick pause. This is going to be one of those repeated themes. It's something that we've heard many times. If you're new here today, one of the things that we have addressed multiple times is why God is doing what he's doing on behalf of the Israelites. And something that we do too, every so often, something good happens and we'll think something along these lines. Well, that must be because I've been extra good lately. Right? Oh, God, he's just rewarding me for being so super duper righteous. Right? And repeatedly, Moses continues to tell the people, no, no, it's not because of who you are. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. It's not because of the attractiveness of the object, of the people. God looked at the people and said, I can't imagine an existence without me being with them. It's not the attractiveness of the people. It's the attentiveness of the subject. It's the attentiveness of God recognizing that he has put his love upon these people. So with that in mind, do not say in your heart, after the Lord your God has thrust them out before you, <clears throat> It's because of my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. Whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. 
We've talked about this already, but this is a promise 830 years in the making. And while those 830 years are happening, two different nations go in two different directions, both geographically and uh, metaphorically. So we have the Israelites who end up enslaved in Egypt, which God told Abraham when he made the promise to about the promise. And he said, hey, but before that happens, your descendants are going to be sojourners or exiles in a land that is not their own for 400 years, right? And so while the Israelites are doing that, the, the Canaanites and, and, and uh, uh, all of these different Jebusites and Gergeshites and all these people are filling the land and, and doing this stuff. And as the Israelites exit the, the land of Egypt and God does all these things, we know because of first, or the Joshua chapter 1 that the word of what God has done on behalf of the Israelites has made its way to these people who are in this land, and still they refuse to worship God. And so essentially, after 830 years of promising the Israelites and 830 years of these people refusing to accept uh, the one true God, at this point, God is saying two things are ready. Number one, Israel, you are ready to take the promised land. Number two, I am ready to deal with the evil that has come up before me from these people. Right, And so both of these things are happening at the same time. So don't say it's because of my righteousness, whereas it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart. Are you going... How awesome is Moses? Again, when you listen to him, don't you hear just old man all the time, right? Repeating, 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 just in hopes that something makes it through your dense little skull, right? Not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart. Are you going in to possess the land? But because of the wickedness of the nations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. And that he may confirm the word that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob. This is really important because, again, we keep saying it. What kind of land is it? It's promised land. That means that there was a promise that was made to the Israelites that this would be their land. That promise came in the form of a covenant with Abraham 830 years ago. And now, finally, God is saying this is the moment where, where that promise comes to, to fruition. And so let's talk about what the role of God is here. What is the role of God? The role of God is that he's the covenant maker. God in this story with the Israelites is the covenant maker. Now, you need to understand that when I say covenant maker, there are three elements to this. Number one is he sets the boundaries, right? The covenant maker is the one who says, I'm going to enter a contractual agreement with you. Here are the expectations. Here are the boundaries. And the boundaries are basically the Deuteronomic principle. Obey and live, disobey and die, right? These are the boundaries that I'm giving to you. And then, just as we heard it in the principle, it's boundaries, blessings, and curses. So if you stay within the boundaries, what are the good things that will happen for you? If you stay within the boundaries, how will you be blessed as a person? But curses are this. If you should violate the terms of this agreement or this covenant, what things will happen to you as a result of that, right? What are the consequences, the blessings and the curses? In our home, my wife and I are the covenant makers with our children, right? We establish the boundaries. We establish the expectations. We tell them the rules that we expect them to follow. We line that out, and we say, if you do what you're supposed to do, then you will be rewarded with things like nightlights at bedtime, and you'll be rewarded with all of these toys, and you'll be rewarded with fun trips to exploration place, and blah, 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 right? But should you choose to try to implement your own will in this situation, we will crush you, right? We will absolutely break you. Not physically, mostly. But anyways, we will crush you. Like, don't do it because then you're going to get, you're going to get consequences. You're going to have toys taken away. You're going to have uh, rights pulled from you, right? Like, we are the ones who determine this. We are the ones who set the boundaries. And you'll never believe it. Sometimes my kids obey, and they are blessed. And sometimes they disobey, and they are cursed. And this is a thing that happens routinely. And so here we see God, the covenant maker, saying, do this, and everything will go great for you. Do this. Everything's going to go terrible for you. God is the covenant maker. It started with Abraham. It has existed through generations. And now 830 years later, Moses is reminding the people of the role of God. Moving on. Verse 6. Know therefore that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess <laughs> because of your righteousness. Are you guys noticing this yet or no? Is it just me? Three times now. Just in case you forgot since a verse and a half ago, it's not because of how good you are. 
does that hurt your feelings? You guys get really quiet every single time I bring that up, and it's just like dead silence. It's like, well, I don't, I'm a little bit special. Is that what's going on in your brains right now? You're not. <laughs> Anyways, it's not because of your righteousness, for you are a stubborn people. Yeah, yep, preach. Remember and do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day you came out of the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you've been rebellious against the Lord. Even at Horeb or Mount Sinai, you provoked the Lord to wrath, and the Lord was so angry with you. It's a Johnny Carson setup if ever I heard it, right? He's so angry. I'm so proud of you guys. I didn't know that was a reference people would pick up on. You, this is why I'm your pastor right here. I love you guys. How angry was he? He was so angry uh, that he was ready to destroy you. Her, her. That one's not a very good punchline. He was so angry. How angry was he? He was going to erase you and leave a greasy spot where you once stood, right? He was going to utterly destroy you for your continued rebellion. In case you're not getting this, it's not because of your righteousness. It's because of God's goodness. Moving on. Verse 9, when I went up to the mountain to receive the tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant that the Lord God made with you, I remained on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water. Uh, by the way, type in shadow. Do you guys remember another person who once upon a time went 40 days without eating or drinking and served as a mediator between the people? Stay tuned. We're going to get there. Okay. Verse 10. And the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone written with the finger of God, and on them were all the words that the Lord had spoken with you on the mountain, out of the midst of the fire on the day of the assembly. And at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord gave me the two tablets of stone, the tablets of the covenant. So again, this is uh, the, the bringing down the Ten Commandments. This is doing this thing, this big deal that's been immortalized in tons of movies. Then the Lord said to me, Arise and go down quickly from here, for your people... <laughs> parents how many of you ever said this hey i need your help a uh, spouse or significant other your son is doing something right your child has your child is making choices in the house right now right i love this because these people are they're god's people and yet here god is having this conversation with moses god is aware of what the people are doing down there and i arise and go down quickly from here for your people whom you have brought out from Egypt, have acted corruptly. And Moses got to be like, no, there's no chance, right? We've only been here for like 40 days. That they, they can't have done anything that bad. Stay tuned. God says, they have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a metal image. They've made for themselves a metal image. I know, Right? There you go. I didn't even have to ask you to do it the second time. You knew what's up. They made for themselves a metal image. You might recall when we listened to the song about the Ten Commandments for 114 weeks as we worked through the Ten Commandments, right? Number two was you shall not have any craven image uh, of any likeness or anything. Of, uh, was it heaven above or earth below or water underneath? Don't bow to them or serve them for I am your Elohim, right? That's the second commandment. Thank you. Thank you. That was so nice. She's clapping for me. Everyone else? Extra 10 minutes on the message. Anyways, so legitimately, second commandment is saying, don't make any graved image. Like, don't carve an image. Like, you cannot encapsulate who I am by making some piece of metal to worship. And so Moses gets the people of Mount Sinai. He goes up to the mountain. He's talking to God. He's getting the Ten Commandments. And in the 40 days after, God Almighty dropped the sea on top of the Egyptians. And he led them to Mount Or, And he got them out of slavery. And they take them the promise. And all of this incredible stuff that God is doing, the people are like, you know, what we should do we should take all of our gold melt it down make a cow to worship because and here's a spoiler are you ready people are dumb right I, now that one shouldn't be surprising well so what's the second question what is the role of the people they are the covenant breaker if god is the covenant maker he establishes the covenant he says if you obey and live you will disobey and die and then the people repeatedly as if Moses is wanting to really highlight how much it's not about their righteousness. The people continue to sin and do exactly what God has told them not to do. Let's do this. Anybody here in the last 24 hours want to own up to their shortcomings? Who here in the last 24 hours has either had a sinful thought or done a sinful thing by a show of hands? Anybody brave enough? 
sinners. You notice my hand wasn't up because I was lying right now. Right? The idea is this. God routinely says, here's what, you, just, just, parents, just do what I'm asking you to. You're like, no. I have a better plan. No. I, I know more than you, God. No, I'm not going to. No. Oh, my gosh, it's infuriating. I understand how God gets so frustrated because he looks at it and says, listen, I have outlined the covenant for you. I made the covenant. Why do you continue to break the covenant? Moving on. Verse 13. It's going to be a little late, team. Here we go. Furthermore, the Lord said to me, I have seen this people, and behold, it is again a stubborn people. Let me alone that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under the heavens. You guys remember what kind of land it was? Promised. Do you see what he just said to Moses? We're going to come back to this because it's super duper important to the chapter. But I want to make sure because sometimes I feel like I read the Bible and you just like listen to the words without really considering what the words mean. They're going to the promised land, a land that was promised to them, that they were promised to enter. And here God is looking at how evil they said, maybe I'll just kill them all and start over with you, Moses. That seems weighty to me. Nobody else seems shocked, but that seems relatively important. Whatever, moving on. It says, I will make a nation of you mightier and greater than they. How tempted do you think Moses is right now, by the way? They do stink. Moses routinely, as we've been going through this thing, has said, it was you that caused me to get so angry that I struck the rock, and now I don't get to go into the promised land, you big, dumb dummies. So yeah, maybe if God's like, hey, I tell you what, Moses, I got a deal. Let's just wipe them all out and start over. You got to think there's at least a small part of Moses like, yeah, let's go. We'll see what he does. So I turned and came down from the mountain. I... I wonder, because you can't assume necessarily, but putting yourself in the mindset of Moses, God just told him, the people are down there, it's been 40 days since I did this miraculous exit, after the 10 plagues, after all this incredible stuff, right? And now they're down there worshiping some golden calf and being sexually immoral. And Moses has got to be like, okay, God's just bluffing. This is I'm going to go down, they're all going to be singing praise and worship music, having a grand old time, really excited about who God is. There's got to be a part of Moses who's walking down like, what kind of weird trick is this that God's playing? So I turned and came down the mountain. And the mountain was burning with fire, and the two tablets of the covenant were in my hands. And I looked, and behold, you had sinned against the Lord your God. You had made yourselves a golden calf, dummies, because you had turned aside quickly from the way that the Lord had commanded you, you dumb dummies. So I took hold of the two tablets, and I threw them out of my hands, and, they broke, and I broke them before your eyes. Now, I used to think, when this was it, that Moses just came down, and he was just angry. Like, gah, gah, right? I thought it was just a, 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 a wrathful moment for Moses. As I was studying this year or this week for this message, I didn't realize this. This was standard par for the course. They used to, uh, they would, they would uh, carve or chisel in covenants in stone. And then if the covenant was broken, the covenant maker essentially would take it. And if he was going to implement the curses, he would smash the stone to the ground. So it was in a bunch of pieces. This is actually a fairly significant thing, Moses. It's not just dummies right it's not just that he's mad it's that he looks at it and he reads the thing and commandment number two says don't do the very stupid thing that you're doing right now and so he's like this is no good anymore and he takes it and he throws it down to the ground because the people have broken the covenant obey and live disobey and remember the last thing god said to moses before he came down what if i just kill them all do you see the weight of the moment that's happening here? Now, what happens in Moses' response is super important for us today. So I took hold of the two tablets. I threw them, on the, or excuse me, throw them out of my hands and broke them before your eyes. Then I lay prostrate before the Lord as before for 40 days and 40 nights. I neither ate bread nor drank water because of all of the <laughs> because of all of the sin that you had committed, Right? In doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. For I was afraid of the anger and hot displeasure. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a great band name. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage. Hot displeasure! Woo! Anyways. <laughs> Dibs. 
It's Dibs. It's mine. That's what we're going to name the worship team. Here we go. <laughs> For I was afraid of the anger and of the hot displeasure that the Lord bore against you so that he was ready to destroy you. But the Lord listened to me that time also. Verse 20, and the Lord was so angry with Aaron, who was the one who was uh, enticed into making this by the people, that he was ready to destroy him. And I prayed for Aaron also at the same time that I took the sinful thing that you had made, the calf that you had made, and I burned it with fire and I crushed it, grinding it very small until it was as fine as dust. And I threw the dust of it into the brook that ran down from the mountain. Skipping ahead to verse 25, he does the three verses of another thing that they did that was dumb, but we're going to stay on this one. Verse 25, so again, I lay prostrate before the Lord these 40 days and 40 nights because the Lord had said that he would destroy you. And I prayed to the Lord, O Lord God, do not destroy your people and your heritage. Your heritage, whom you've redeemed through your greatness, whom you have brought out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do not regard the stubbornness of this people or the wickedness of their sin, lest the land from which you brought us say, so going back to Egypt, because the Lord was not able to bring them into the land that he promised them, and because he hated them, he's brought them out and put them to death in the wilderness. For they are your people and your heritage, whom you brought out by your great power and your outstretched arm. Again, put yourself in the position of Moses. Moses, who has put himself on the line repeatedly for these people, who, who went up and stood uh, right uh, in the face of Pharaoh and explained, you need to let my people go. And Pharaoh said, no. And then he's, he's, he's speaking out all these things that God is going to do. The entire time, Pharaoh could have struck Moses down at any moment. Moses has put his life on the line repeatedly for these people. And the whole time, he pleads with them, please, 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 just stop looking for your comfort in other places. Trust that the God who just did this mighty, miraculous thing is actually the God who he says he is and stop looking to worship other places. And the people continue to do this. They continue to abandon their God. They continue to break the covenant. And even as Moses is up there, what should be this powerful, beautiful moment for the nation of Israel, as he's receiving the covenant, as he's getting the law carved into stone, as he's walking down this thing, this should be this incredible high, this moment of celebration. And as he walks down, he sees them doing the same thing over and over again. God had already offered him, hey, Moses, let's just start it over. Now, was God really offering that? I don't think he was. I think he wanted to see Moses' response in this moment. And what was Moses' response? Don't forget him. Right? You can see it again. For they are your people and your heritage whom you brought out by your great power and your outstretched arm. Moses goes and he falls on his face before God and he says essentially, and we'll see this in the next chapter, if you're going to wipe them out, you've got to wipe me out too. That's insane. If you're going to take them out, then you've got to take me out too. Don't forget the promise that you made. Don't look weak to the other nations. You have done something here. You have started a work. Finish the work. Moses goes and stands, not before Pharaoh, who could, who could, of course, strike him dead, right? But stands before God Almighty, who has his eternity in his hands. And he says to God, don't do what you're thinking about doing on behalf of people who continue to make terrible choices. Are you guys picking up where this is a type and shadow yet? Preliminary questions. What is the role of Moses? Moses is the great mediator. What does a mediator do? A mediator, so at my last job before uh, getting back into ministry, I was in the court system, and a lot of times I was in criminal court with uh, these hooligans who were making bad choices, but a lot of times when I was working with them, they also had family issues that were going on, custody things or whatever, and so most of the time I prepared and presented in criminal court, but every so often I had to go to family court, and sometimes in those family courts, there would be people who were going through a divorce when the kid got in trouble, uh, and those people who were going 
through a divorce, absolutely hated one another, right? And they couldn't be trusted to talk to one another in civil ways. It was so contentious. It was so terrible. And so what they would do in those situations is the court would appoint a court-appointed mediator. And the mediator would come in and basically talk to one, then go talk to the other, then go talk to the other one again, then back and forth, and trying to figure out, okay, once we get through all of the anger and once we get through all of the animosity and the enmity, where can we come to a settlement that will work for both sides? And so Moses goes and he stands before God Almighty as this mediator. He says, listen, God, you're, you're rightful in your wrath to destroy them. That is a reasonable thing based on the covenant. That is something that you could do. I'm standing in the middle on their behalf asking you not to do that. I'm standing in the middle asking that instead of death, you give life, even though that is reserved for the blessing and the covenant. In the same way a mediator works in the court, Moses stood as the mediator for the people. Now, let's type and shadow this bad boy, shall we? Uh, I think that I even put a bookmark in my Bible. Let's see if I did. Did I? I did. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says this. First of all, then, I urge that all supplications, prayers... Excuse me. Intercessions and thanksgiving be made for all people to pray on behalf of others, which is what Moses is essentially doing here. For kings and all who are in high positions that, ooh, so let's just stop there for one second before we get it back into the thing. You should be praying for kings and those in high positions, like presidents. I know, shocking. Here we go. Oh, and by the way, it doesn't say in here, depending on what political party they're affiliated with. Whatever. Send your uh, letters to Matt. He would like to read those. <laughs> For kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead peaceful and quiet, godly and dignified lives in every way. This is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man and that is Christ Jesus. The reason that we celebrate the gospel, the reason that we celebrate who Jesus is and what Jesus did was because in doing what he did, he was the mediator who stands between us and a rightfully wrathful God. He's the mediator who stands before God and says, yes, I know they deserve death, but what about life? Because the story of Jesus Christ is the one who lived the righteous, perfect life, the one that the Israelites couldn't live. And by the way, by the show of hands earlier, I'm disappointed to say the one that you haven't lived either, right? Because Jesus came and lived the perfect life that we couldn't live. It was on account of his righteousness when it could never be on account of our righteousness. And in the same way that they used to have to slaughter the, the bulls and the goats and the, and the doves and all these things to make sacrifices. Because consistently throughout the Bible that when sin enters into the equation, blood must be spilled in order to find uh, the forgiveness, the, the, the ability to be made righteous from your sin. That once and for all, Jesus said, if there has to be blood that's spilled, let it be mine. And he stood in the gap and he serves as the mediator, bringing together a holy and righteous and perfect God and broken and sinful people back to where they once were. The story of Moses is a type and a shadow of the incredible gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel that says this, even though you could never be righteous enough on your own, even though you could never earn the, the, the glory and the righteousness of God, even though you could never have attained that on your own, Jesus Christ took your place and said, wait, let me mediate on your behalf. He offered his life for yours. He paid your price so that you might be able to have access back to the glory of God. When we look at the story of Moses, I will say this. Yeah, he's repetitive. He's a little bit cantankerous. Moses is a guy who's pretty tired of all the people. And can I be honest? I think sometimes we all hit that point. I know I do. Sometimes I'm tired of the people. And I just want to sit down and be quiet. And I don't want to talk to anybody at all. Maybe ever again. Who knows? Right? I think we all have moments where we're just like, we're, we're giving up, right? And yet Moses, when pressed by God, and God says, what if we just start all over? What if, what if, what if, We'll just wipe them out. I'll start over with you again. It'll be another 830 years, but maybe the next time they'll finally get it right. Moses knew a very startling truth about his people. 
They're never going to get it right. You notice what Moses didn't say when he mediated? Give us a little more time, we'll figure it out. He didn't say that. What he said was, if, if you do this, then people are going to look and think that you brought these people out of the wilderness just to have them die. Don't, don't lessen your great name that way. And God said, yep, correct answer. And so God routinely, like uh, uh, consecutively after this, repeatedly goes back into a covenant with these people who are going to continue to violate it, continue to break it, because he knows that one day where Moses is the type and shadow of a mediator between God and humanity, that one day Christ would come and be the true and better, the mediator who would save all people from their sin should they put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, today as we're talking through this, that's what the gospel is. If you're here and you're like, yeah, that's cool, but I don't know what I've ever done with that. Or I'm not entirely sure I understand all the things that are happening. Because there's a lot of things happening in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's what we do here. I make myself readily available to you right out there in the lobby. Also, I haven't done this in a while. Let's do it. People get nervous when I do this. If you don't have my phone number, are you ready for it? You ready? If, if you need it, get ready. Area code 720 because I refuse to change to a Kansas number, right? Because that's my last little bit of Denver hanging on, right? Area code 720-369-8690. That's out on YouTube too. That's just out there in the internet, right? And the reason is because of this. If you have a question about what it means for Christ to be your mediator, that's what I'm here for. Reach out to me. We talk through that. We will talk about that. We're doing a baptism next week that Matt's going to talk about here in just a second. We're, there, there are decisions that are being made in this church. And if you're here and you're like, man, I need to know more about what this really means, talk to me about that. Come, I'm getting texts right now. Funny people. All right. Oh, wait. Hold on. Wait. Actually, let's just see. I got five. Hold on. One of them says, let's play eight ball. All right. Anyways. Can you be a little bit more holy, people? This is why someone had to mediate on your behalf. Anyways, but that's it. I want you guys to know that this is what Aviator is about, is recognizing the true and better, is recognizing the one true mediator who is there to restore your right relationship with the God of the universe. Let's pray. Father God, God, I praise you for the example of Moses with the Israelites, that even though he had the opportunity to cast them aside, and maybe he didn't really, but even though that was thrown out to him, that God, his response was no. And not because of our righteousness or their goodness or whatever, but he said no because of who you are, God. Because of your goodness and your power. Don't lessen your great name in this way. God, I pray right now for people who are in this room that through the cross of Jesus Christ, we know that you have extended peace where there once was war. That we know that you... Uh, through the cross, have offered us a way back into your goodness and into your glory. And so, God, I pray right now that if there are people who are in this room or people who are listening online that don't understand that or who have not come to an understanding of what it means to be back, to be made righteous through the blood of Jesus Christ, that, God, they would reach out, that they would talk, they would get their questions answered, and that ultimately, God, more names would be written into your book of life. God, I love you for the fact that you didn't give up on us. Thank you for your goodness when we are not. It's your name we pray. Amen.